Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 186 for Monday, October 22nd, 2018. Thanks, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast that you know by for and about working musicians. That's who we are. And me here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Out in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. Welcome to our weekly chat. Yes, weekly, except last week. But, you know, yeah, last uh, week, my bad. That's all right. It happens. Schedules, man. You know, it's life. It's life. It is life. We're back here. How's it going, though? Uh, it's going. I finished yesterday my second of three weekends of Brecktone. So I guess that right, right the last time that we talked, uh, I was in rehearsals for Brecktones. No, I was about to start rehearsals for Brecktones, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did, you know, whatever, four nights, or three nights of rehearsal, preview night, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday gigs last week, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday gigs this past weekend. And um it's, it's been, it's actually been, the show is a blast. It's a really, it's a one act show. It runs about 90 minutes. As I said, it, this, it's the, the premise and the story is that it takes place in a bar. Uh, the singer of the bar band is playing what turns out to be the last gig of his life. And it's sort of a, a band that's backing up a beat poetry night at this dive bar, wherever it is. And, uh, and and the band plays some songs and then there's poets involved. And one of the poets that comes up is his is a daughter he didn't know he had. And and so there's a story that sort of evolves there that goes throughout the night. But and and his songs are and Billy Butler is the the guy who wrote it. He's also the piano player in the band and the, the main character in the show. And, you know, his songs are stellar. I've played them many times over the years. Not these particular songs, but I've played his songs many times over the years. And he's yep. just a great songwriter and really fun to collaborate with and work with. So that part of it's great. I am playing, what did I count the other day? Uh, I'm using no less than five different uh, types of sticks slash brushes slash mallets to play in this show. How big is the audience you perform for? Uh, it's a 75 seat theater and Fridays and Saturdays have been pretty close to sold out. Sundays are, you know, about 60, 60% 60 full kind of thing. Um, and, and it's a great, the, the cool part about it is that it's like a bar gig. And so there is no fourth wall in the theater sense, right? You know, we can communicate with the crowd. They're, they're there because it's supposed to be like a bar gig and, and it's pretty loose in t I mean, some uh, m much of the show is scripted, but much of it is not. We have four poets, four different poets that come up every night and just tell us like, hey, I want what did somebody say yesterday? I want uh, an imperial death march. You know, and it's like, oh, OK. And mm -hmm. so as the band, we come up with whatever it is that's going to be an imperial death march underneath or slash behind <laughs> Whatever this poetry is, you know, and, and it's so it's really it's I mean, it, and we don't know what's going to happen until they literally they walk on stage and say something like that. And it's like, oh, yeah, OK. And we so that that part's been really fun. Just, you know, imp the whole show has been fun, but I'm playing with sticks, rods, mallets sometimes uh, for the Imperial Death March. I definitely use mallets on the toms um, and uh, and then two different types of brushes I've actually found in this room. There's there's one tune that needs like some really creamy brushwork. And uh, so I have these lighter brushes that I use just for this one song and uh, and it works out really well. So, cool. yeah, it sounds been, like a really creative thing. It sounds, you know, spontaneous and improv improvisational and and the premise of the story seems really cool. So I, I bet it's really going great. It's fu it's been really fun and, and the crowds have really loved it. And, you know, it's interesting because we have the four guest poets, but then both. Well, actually, Billy. And uh, and Haley, who plays his daughter, and then uh, this guy, Bruce, who plays death uh, and is the bartender, uh, each of them do their own poems. And and that part of it is scripted. So we know what they're going to say. Like, we know that that, you know, at one point, Haley's going to say, I need um, bitter sentiment, you know, 
And and we had to learn and through rehearsals, it was like we can't just jump right into the jam that we know is bitter sentiment. We have to treat it just like we do when any of the other poets come up and it's like, look around. All right, guys, what key, you know, just like on the spot so that it all seems to flow. And it's gotten to the point where we've gotten so good at it that people have come up afterwards, like friends, like. So when the po- the guest poets come up, <laughs> are you guys like really making that up on the spot or are you just faking that? And like, no, no. well, we are yeah. faking it in that we are making it up on the spot. Yeah. Love it. It's yeah. Cool. It's, it's really fun. Um, it, it's, it's, it's. And you like the, the theater troupe and you, Billy, you know, you have a lot of respect for Billy. So it's. Yeah. Very fulfilling but it really is just a band. I mean, there's only seven of us, right? There's four uh-huh. of us, uh, four musicians, well, five musicians counting Billy. There's the. Uh, guitar bass drums and a sax player and then billy plays keyboards and then there's Haley and bruce and so you yeah. know that's it it's just it's just us and um you know we can interact with the crowd and there's there's a lot of it's it's really it's um more fun than most rock gigs i will say um which is great you know because we get to we get to actually perform and and be part of the the thing that entertains people which is which is yep. you know which is my thing that you know, as a, as a rock musician, that's what I like to do. So it's great. Yeah. It's fun. So very good. So I have, um, I have an interesting tale to share. Okay. So this is a tale of two bands and we're going to call the first band, the amazing super duper squirrels. Okay. The amazing (laughs) super duper squirrels, um, have been around in a few different forms over for probably 15 years. Yeah. Um, they were originally a different name, but one guy, you know, is, is the constant thread through the whole thing. And um, about a year ago, all of a sudden the amazing super duper squirrels um, got, got a lot more attention, a lot more better gigs, okay. you know, we're kind of doing it. Some, some new personnel. Sure. Um, you know, terrific band. Um, you know, we're getting good gigs, deservedly so. They were a good band. Sure. Um, mysteriously, a couple of people in the band made announcements they were leaving the band and didn't seem like there was, a, you know, there was a lot of nice things said. You know, I had a great time and it was, you know, a great ride. Um, and stay tuned for future announcements, you know, my next gig and that type of thing. Sure, of course. Yeah. And then mysteriously, um, another band has been created that contains some of these people and other people. Sure. Uh, they form, form their own group. Not, and they not surprisingly. Them, yep. Yep. And they have named themselves Squirrel. Ah, okay. So, um, the amazing super duper Squirrels leader is like, what the heck? Right. And actually interacted with me and just to, you know, maybe because I do this podcast, and said, you know, what do you think I should do? I've sent a cease and desist letter and, uh, you know, I own the copyright. I started the band. I was in the band before, you know, what, what should we do? Yeah. And I said, well, I'm not a, I'm not a legal expert. You right. Know, right. I would always say, you know, there's a certain amount of how much is it worth to litigate this yeah. or pursue this, you know, like literally how much is it worth? Yep. How much of this is just the indignancy that this happened? Yeah. What, what, uh, will you feel differently in two weeks? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And, and, uh, uh, you know, th- and I don't think this is a necessarily uncalm thing. And the person's position was, you know, I, I started this band. I had this band. Uh, it was other names. I've done it. I did all the work I've, I've, you know, I, I owned it. And, um, the person left and they felt that the last year was a success because of them and that they own it. But I own it, you know, like I, I filed a trademark of the name of the band, you know, yeah. however, however you can demonstrate that you own a band, I own a band. And, um, but this new band, and, uh, I mean, the name is similar and is it intentionally trying to confuse people? I mean, it sounds like it is right. Yeah. Is, okay. Yeah. My, my assumption then is that is that it is. Are people right? are people being confused by it? Because that's like if we're going to get into the legal. I've I've done a little bit of the trademark thing. I, I think you probably have too. where, you, you know, it's it's is there, it, there, there it's the whole reasonable man's interpretation. Right. Like with mm-hmm. someone that was going to see the amazing super duper squirrels 
be confused by this other band being having some people that might or might not have been in the, you know, like, how are they presenting themselves? This yeah. squirrels band. Right. I mean, that's or squirrel. Sorry. Uh, I'm trying to stick with our 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 assigned names here because that's not actually <laughs> the names of these bands. I don't know the names, so that's helpful. Right. Uh, I can't screw up um, unless I <laughs> unless I do it unintentionally. But, uh, you, you know, like, is it is, is there a an intention, a clear intention of, of them trying to capitalize and, and in, in, intrude on this thing or. Yeah. I'd say that I, it seems that there is. And, okay. and um, yeah, fair. You know, yeah. as I've watched this, there's a little bit of, you know, Facebook fan communication. Um, and again, the, the name I don't believe is an accident, right? Mm. It's, it's, it's not an accident. So, so it and is potentially so, causing market confusion that you're already seeing on Facebook. I, I think, I think it's absolutely causing market well, confusion. That, that's that's where the trademark office or the trademark yes, law says, okay, but yeah, but uh, you know, yes. we're talking about you know, ten grand a year in, in gigs, right? Yeah, and not so, worth you know, calling the trademark office. Well, that's the deal. Yep. And so, you know, you, you fire a first salvo, which is a cease and desist letter, and absolutely. you know, then the other person says, "Thank you, but no, thank you." Um, they call your bluff. My <laughs> advice was have a really, really, really professional response when the places you go for bookings ask about the confusion. Yeah. I, I said that's actually the, my, my thought was that is the first point of, of clarity is like, you know, petty doesn't help. Um, professional does. Are you still good enough? You know, you know, do you have a real band? You know, are you, are you, did you replace and move on? And again, I've only heard what was reached out to me was from, was from the original leader, the original band. Yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, so, so that, that was my response is like, I, that's a really good, okay, like, I like know, that. Yeah. Because, because a year from now, What's going to be there is potentially some market confusion, right? I mean, no question that that's that's a, a real thing that, that could happen. But the reality is, you know, it's not like these people who are booking the gigs are like morons, right? They they know Tim. Right. At, Fans break up. Right. Tim yeah. at, you know, five, 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 one, two, one, two is the guy I used to call to book whatever the hell the band's name was. I can still call Tim at five, 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 one, two, one, two, you know, and, and I'll probably still get Tim when I call that number. So like, yeah, you're going to, you know, but they might ask. And that's when you just want to be totally pro about it and say, yeah, yeah you know, and we can't control what other bands do with their names. We do have a trademark. We sent a, a cease and desist beyond that. You know, we just need to keep doing what we do here. Yes. And we'd love to keep playing. Like, I, I think it's okay to share that amount of dirty laundry and no more. Like, yep, we sent a cease. We know what you're yeah. talking about. Because of that, we sent a cease and desist. But, you know, what dates do you have available? Leave it behind. Yep. Talk yep. about get, it matter of factly and yep. move on. Yep. I love it. That's I, I think that's exactly right. I would also say that that tactic of like, why not just start a new band? You know, if you're so great and you have a you know reputation, why not just start a new band and, and make your own way? That tactic of creating market confusion might be indicative of the thinking, oh, you know. Yeah, it'll make them look unprofessional. It'd be way better if they called themselves the Zippers. I'm going to go in with the squirrel theme <laughs> I here. Gotcha, the okay, gotcha. good. They'll call themselves the Zippers <laughs> and say, with members formerly in the amazing yeah. Super Duper Squirrels, right? Like that creates no confusion. In fact, it clears yeah. up any confusion and says, oh, you know, I always like, always like that tuba player in the amazing super duper squirrels. I want to go see her in the zippers. So great. It's just so rare to have a female tuba player. So it's just, it, that's, it's a unique thing. I know. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. There should be more of them because yeah, the ones I know are awesome. I uh, agreed. Uh, it's actually, <laughs> I, I know a female tuba player and she's fantastic. So there yes, you go. I agree. Yes. But yeah, I mean, th those types of messy things that come up in a scene happen. And, um, you know, managing them in a business-like way is a, is a smart thing. I mean, it's just, it's a smart thing. It's just also your reputation. So yeah. you get and to I decide that, how you act, not how yeah. anybody else acts. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And, um, I, you know, I do also believe there is, if, if someone felt they had the right to the name, they would have kept the name. Right. And if, if they had to leave the group, 
why not just start another group? Like, right. like that tactic of being aggressive and creating market confusion doesn't serve anybody. And it, and it just, you know, it, it creates well, look at, intrigue. Like, look, look at what happened with, with yes. Right. I mean, that's a yeah. classic uh, yeah. example where it turned out because of, because of he played on every record that Chris Squire owned the name. And, uh, and so when Anderson Rabin and Wakeman went out and when Anderson Bruford Wakeman and Howe went out years before, that's what they called themselves. They didn't come call themselves affirmative, you know, it's like, oh yeah, we can confuse people, you know, but they did the work to get their names recognized so that they could you know, totally monopolize. And then yeah. did they actually say formally of yes, or did you uh, just yeah, know who those yeah. guys well, are? It might, well, it might've been Anderson Rabin, uh, Wakeman, an evening of yes music or something, yeah, which so they're totally they, allowed they to do. They leveraged it all. They yeah. totally, yeah, but they weren't trying to say they were yes. Now that Chris Squire has passed and and Steve Howe and uh, and John Anderson sort of made peace again at the whole uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing. Yeah. Now they both tour under the name yes. So do Steve you know if, uh, if uh, that was a contentious thing when Howe and Rabin went out? Did, did they want to be yes and Chris Squire wouldn't let him use the name? When Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, and Howe went out, yeah, they it was. It, it, it was contentious. Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a whole falling out happening there. So there have been several falling outs in that band. Should call themselves no. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, there was the falling out between Chris Squire and, I think, and John Anderson. and But then, you know, John Anderson and Steve Howe also have, you know, I mean, they're two really egotistical, creative, talented people And they don't always quite mesh. But, I mean, you hear John talk about even when he's not getting along with Steve, he's like, well, I mean, he's still my brother. He's like, we created some things that are amazing that are never going to go away. Yeah. Yeah. They they patched things up, though. Right. Before before. Certainly. There's plenty of documented things when they were when they were not not patched up where they referred to each other as like, you know we still created this music and, you know, yeah. so they still, they still had a little bit of a high road, you know, as yes. they work through that stuff. As there was a lot of bitterness, it. obviously. Yeah, clearly. But they How kept, sleep? they kept that out of the, they, they tried to keep that amongst themselves. It didn't quite work, but you know, they were the Beatles too. So it's kind of hard, you know. But. So have your act together, have a good story to tell bands break up. I'm still your contact. You know, we've worked together. We have a successful relationship. I will bring you quality information, quality entertainment, you know, and you can still count on me and then deliver the goods, move on and then deliver the goods. Then just business as usual is is all you need. As long as business as usual is good, then you're, you're golden. If it's not, well, how about this? How about this? Say it's, um, say, say it's a band and they lose a front person Mm. and the front person goes and starts something. So that person's identifiable. Yep. Um, same message. Uh, you know, it depends. Is the band identifiable without that front person? Because if the answer is, if you had, you know, one great singer and then four shoegazers behind him, yeah. well, who cares who the shoegazers were? Right. Right. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's not a condemnation of that as your band's formula. Like that has worked well for many great bands. However, uh, you know, like, if Bono leaves you too, I, you know, I mean, now there's sort of a, I mean, they're a thing. It's amazing. They've actually been together as long as they have without changing any members. But you, you know, if in the eighties, if Bono left you too, uh, you know, the edge could have gotten a gig somewhere. Right. Yeah. But would anybody have known about Larry or Adam? I don't know. You know, mm. like, I mean, some people would have, but it would have faded pretty quick. I think that band yeah. succeeded because Bono's personality spilled all over everything, including the three other people in the band. <laughs> but yeah, you know. I, I, well, I would, I would bring this back around. If you are a band leader, a band owner, yeah, but you're not a front person. Yeah. There are some structural things you might want to do because bands change, you know, people leave yes. and you may come across someone great and you know, they may leave. So, um, the wedding so, band circuit is full of scenarios, just like you, you described where the Inter- leader- interchangeable, <laughs> interchangeable parts. And the leader does his job to say, Hey, listen, look, I, I've been doing this for X amount of years. I am all about quality entertainment. I find the best people and I bring them in. And, uh, and so, you know, it may be someone different, but you know, the band's going to cook and you can trust me. Yeah. And I think that's actually the, that's the task in front of the band leader. If, 
if you're not the front person. Well, even if you are the front person, I mean, you're still convincing people that you're going to bring a great band in. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's certainly a longer road to hoe if you are not uh, part of the onstage personality of the band. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you right. People need to trust that whoever you are behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, doesn't matter. You're going to put a good the the act that whoever's paying wants on stage every time. Yep. And as long as you're doing that, then then people will just trust it. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's good stuff. It's all good. Hey, I, I, I wanted to I actually had this on the list for a couple of weeks, but I've, I've been doing it for the Brechtone show and I have found that wearing 10% tinted sunglasses on stage is, is like, it's blissful because it's just enough to like cut some of the lights that are always in your eyes. Mm. It looks good from the crowd, which means if you need to close your eyes to find a harmony or whatever, you can do it and things still look okay from out there, right? They're not quite aware that your eyes are closed. But that that 10 percent tint man on the sunglasses and I, you can get them from Zenny. I wear very mild prescriptions and it's actually kind of nice to be able to see the crowd. I, I have, yeah. I'm, yeah. And uh, and that 10 percent tint is freaking awesome. So I, I just well, wanted to think because I didn't even I haven't even heard of that 10 percent tint. I, it, I, I thought they're either sunglasses or not sunglasses. Yeah, that's the thing. Right. So go to Zenny uh, dot com, which is a great place to get glasses because you can just Z or X Z E N N I. And uh, and when you're ordering your glasses, you just choose whether there's no tint. I think it's no zero percent, which is like normal, like not sunglasses, Z- uh, zero, 10, 50 or 80. And uh, and I've got a couple of pairs of glasses. I've got blue and I've got I think it's like tan or, you know, a brownish thing. But it's, it's they look cool. They look they look cool. And they um, and, and they're really functional. I mean, it's it's really nice to be able to I don't even notice. Like I could drive with these things on and it would not be an issue at night, like no problem. So they aren't really blocking that much, but especially the blue ones cuts out a lot of that yellow of those lights that are just like beating at my, at your eyes all night. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. It's, it's, I love a, it. it's a good thing. Yeah. 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 Cool. It's cool. We had, um, Speaking of functional things, we had a a question in our Facebook group from listener John, who says, I have a very unhappy drummer. He is unhappy because when we mic him up and pump him through the PA, his drums sound dead and just sort of there instead of like cannons. Uh, We're a rock band. A lot of the venues we play in are small, so we end up having to mute the drum mics, except the kick and maybe the snare. Says I'd call him a medium loud drummer. He hits hard, but not insanely so. I've definitely played with much louder guys. And he plays with proper technique and doesn't ever break sticks or heads or dent them. But as you know, a live drum kit can just be loud. We recently did an outdoor gig where we had all the drums in the PA, and it's just kind of dead sounding. Everything is clear and coming through, but it's not punching very well. We don't actually get to run all the drums through the PA often, so it's a throw-and-go situation, and we're better than we were 20 years ago, but we don't know what we're doing when it comes to making drums really pop in a band mix. We've got decent mics, and we're running through a Behringer X18 mixer. We've had the same issue with two different kits. One's a DW and one's a Mapex. Any tips, pointers, reading, ideas? He says, I've spent many years idiot-proofing my guitar rig, but I have no idea what to do with drums. So let me, let me ask a couple of questions from a lay perspective. Right? Yeah, absolutely. You're not a lay so, person. You're just not a drummer. I'm not I'm a, a lay drummer person. <laughs> yeah, there so, you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, my thought is that the essence of drum sound, you have to start with good sounding drums. Like the drums, like, like you, you should not have the assumption that you're going to EQ average sounding drums into great sounding drums. That Fair is, assumption. It's, well, that's true with any instrument. And right. yes, absolutely true with drums. Yeah. For so sure. that said, you know, starting with that and assuming this gentleman has good, good looking drums, good sounding drums. Um, in, in three sentences, what do you want EQ on drums to do? What, what do you want live sound reinforcement on drums to do? Bring out the natural sound, tune out bad things in the room, um, adjust for, you know, room peculiarities, yeah. accentuate opportunities because of the room. You know, just real briefly, what is, what is the goal of, 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 
of applying sound reinforcement to drums. Well, I mean, the the first goal is to just make them louder, right? I mean, if you make you, good you know, sound louder, yeah, to take. I mean, just like you'd put sound reinforcement on your voice, right? You can sing and sound great at the stage, but without a mic in front of you, no one's going to hear you, right? So. Uh, that that's step one is you want to take the sound of the drums and project it further than the drums would normally project themselves. Okay, great. Number one. And, and then, yes, once you, once you choose to do that, then you have to think about the EQ and say, all right, well, what's happening in this room? Is there some low end rumble? Do we need to, uh, you know, put a high pass filter on everything, but the floor Tom, so that there's not this rumble from the kick and the floor every time he hits like a, you know, a, 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 you know, his high toms or whatever. Like you, you want to, like you said, accentuate the, the, the natural resonance of, of the drum. But, but really all EQ should be doing is removing frequencies that are unwanted, never adding. Now, I mean, I say that, do I ever add anything with EQ? Yes. But usually it's because it's like, all right, we've got everything, you know, we've pulled out all the crap that we don't want, but it would be nice to have a little more sparkle here at, you know, 6K or something. So you go, okay, fine. We'll nudge that up. But really, if if all you're doing with EQ is nudging up as opposed to pulling down, well, then you're doing it wrong, to be perfectly <laughs> frank. No, because you're not actually adding anything, right? Got it. You know. So, so EQ uh, accommodates for where the the natural sound of the drums meets the room. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Fair? And, and yes, right. but here's the thing about drums. Most of us as drummers hear our kits very differently from the way A, anyone else hears our kits and B, from the way microphones hear our kits, right? Mm. Uh, there was a, I think it was when Rush recorded, it was either Permanent Waves or Moving Pictures where because of this, Peart actually wore a condenser mic on his chest that they like strapped or taped to him or something so that a microphone could pick up the sound that he heard of his drum kit. Because when you put a mic, you know, two feet away, three feet away from a drum, that's very different than a mic an inch away from the corner of a drum head, right? It's going to sound different. So my advice for anyone that's going to be miking drums in the studio, live, whatever is listen to the drums and get your head close and hear what that drum sounds like right there. And my guess is that this guy's, I mean, he, you know, he, they, he mentioned decent brands, right? DW and Mapex, they certainly make good drums. We'll assume that the bearing edges on the drums are all good and the heads actually are free to resonate. But if the bearing edges have gotten beat up over the years, well, that could make the drums themselves sound, you know, very dead and muffled. But my guess is he's he's using the wrong heads for the effect that he wants. Uh, if he really wants drums that sound live and and bouncy, you might want to go with a like a single ply head. You don't want something that's going to deaden or muffle the sound. Although to you as the drummer, that may now sound too bouncy and boingy. Um, it you know it's like anything. It's like it's like with a guitar, right? You you have to think about how this is going to sound in a, a room that you're playing and like, you can't just show up and plug in your guitar and expect that the EQ that you had in your bedroom is going to be perfect for, you know, this big concert hall or an outdoor venue. Like it's, it's a different thing and you've got to tweak that. Well, guitar players have knobs to tweak their EQ. Some of them use them. Some of them don't. <laughs> uh, the drummers also have knobs They're you know, I mean, you can retune, but it is a, oftentimes I find it's a, a head choice thing. So like I have, I have uh, a Mapex kit that, I find coded emperors, Remo uh, emperor heads. They're, I think they're, they're okay, emperors two ply. No, I think emperors are sing. I got to get my facts right on that. Um, but uh, it, you know, they sound good on those drums. They've got some liveliness to them. But if I put a coded emperor on my birch kit, it's way t it, okay. So they're two ply heads. They're two seven mil heads. So they're, but it's right up against each other. And, and they have a nice resonance to them. And on my birch kit, you, you lose all the tone of the drum when you do that. Um, on my birch kit, I find that pinstripes, which actually have thicker, it's a clear, well, you can get them coated, but I, I like the clear heads on those toms. And uh, and they've got a seal around the edge where the, the heads are actually fused together. They're glued together. And, 
And that changes the sound. It gives it a more focused sound and it, and you really get that tone, that birch tone out of the drum. So, you know, you got to think about that. And also, again, what's a microphone going to hear when it's right up against it? My guess is these guys, drum, this guy's drums are probably tuned too low to let the drum do any resonating. And I'm not hearing them. I mean, I could be completely off base here, but based on what's been described, it's, it's either the wrong heads or the wrong heads and, and, and also just not, not tuned up enough to, to get some, some bounce out of the drums. A lot of drummers like to hear the, the drums lower uh, with a lower fundamental note than, uh, than the drum actually is built for. And, uh, and that, you know, that can obviously make it so that the head's not resonating enough and there's not enough tone coming out of it. And then you don't get any attack because the head is, is, you know, too loose and flappy. And so there's no attack and there's no, you know, the drum, the drums won't, what, what did he, what was the, the term he was looking for? He said he wanted him to punch like, well, in order to punch, you need a little, you know, you need to be moving some air. <laughs> so that, that, that would be, I mean. But just listen to the drums. Get real close. Listen to them. Maybe the sticks, right? Think about the tip of the the shape of the tip of of your sticks. I find uh, for like this Brecktone show where I'm in a small room and I want the tone and that punch to be the thing, but I don't want too much explosion out of the drums. I'll use a stick that has a bead on the tip so that you're really getting like a focused, you know, hit on the drum. Whereas playing like bigger rock gigs or whatever, I'll use a tip uh, that has more of a, a taper to it. That's less, less round and, and more kind of elongated. So you get a bigger surface hitting that drum, bigger surface hitting the cymbals. And it, you know, it, it causes more sound to just kind of explode out of the drum. And so you, you got to experiment yeah. with that. It's not, you know, it, what everything about the application the of, what about the application of things like gates and um, like said, filters and that type of thing? Filters are considered EQ. Oh, every, yeah. I mean, yes. In a, yeah. And a filter would be EQ, um, a, a gate, you know, so back in the, in the seventies and eighties, right. We, we learned to love gates on our drums and all of that, but in a, in a studio, you can get away with that live gating things. I, you know, you might gate the bottom mic on a snare drum. If the, if the drums are tuned such that when he hits the, you know, 10 inch Tom, the snares rattle a little bit. Really, you should just yeah. retune things to kind of deal with that. But in a in a pinch, an engineer might say, "Okay, well, I'm just going to gate the snare so that that you know doesn't always cut through the mics." But unless you're in a huge room, you're still going to hear the snare rattle. I mean, it's right yep. you know it's right over there. <laughs> like you can't stop a you can't gate a drum acoustically that way. You know, you can only do it when you're when the mics are the only thing that or the main thing that's that's you know producing sure. it. So. Yeah. All right. So to wrap it all up, start with good sounding drums. Be realist, realistic about the sounds of your drums. Yeah. Apply EQ to mitigate where the drum sound meets the room sound, the ambient conditions that you have. Not yeah. not to accentuate or decentuate, more to remove remove problems rather than to try and tone shape. Fair. Right. That's fair. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, rem yeah. Yes. Use EQ to remove, remove problems and, and certainly season to taste a little bit. Uh, you know, I mean, it like if, if a drum's got a little too much resonance in, in one frequency, you can just take that out and it's like, Oh, okay. okay there it is. Nice. Great. Because again, you know, a mic that's an inch away from a drum is going to pick up some things that that drum doesn't necessarily communicate a foot, three feet, 10 feet away. You know, that's yeah. why John Bonham had most, a lot of what he did was room mics. That's not all of what he did. There was a three mic technique that, oh, which engineer was it? Was it, was it, it wasn't Glenn Johns. No, who was it? Anyway, it, there's this three mic technique where there's a mic on the kick and then one mic directly over the snare and then a mic equidistant. For, the, the, you take the distance that that one goes from the, the, the head of the snare to the mic and then go sideways off the floor, Tom. And so those two mics are equidistant from the snare drum. So the snare drum gets right in the middle of that stereo picture. Uh, but you have one, one mic aiming sideways at the, you know, at the kit from, you know, to the right of the floor, Tom, if you're a right-handed drummer and, uh, and then one directly over the snare. And that was a part of the magic of Bonham too. Yes. The room mics, mm. we heard a lot of that sort of sustain of the drums in the room, but that, 
that sound of the kick and the snare was really created by that three mic pattern. So cool. Yep. And I'm going to, I'll put a link in the show notes. There's a guy named Bob Gatson, who's sort of a, a drum I- inventor. Uh, he's sort of crazy, but he, uh, in a good way. And he really kind of sussed out the way to a way. There's not one correct way, but a way to tune drums. That's very teachable. And he's an excellent educator as well. And he created some of the heads for Evans, like the hydraulic heads in the seventies and stuff that or the eighties that we used to make it sound like the seventies. And, uh, and he's got some videos. It, I, I got it. I got his videos on VHS years ago, but he really talks through how to take a drum and not only tune it well, but learn its range in a very short period of time. So I'll put a link in the show notes to Bob's, uh, Bob's videos. So. Very cool. Yeah. What else do we have? Um, happy day after Tom Petty's birthday. Yeah, a couple of days right. after. Yeah. That's 20th. Right. Yeah. Did yeah. you play any Petty this weekend? Uh, no, I played Brechtone shows and for sound checks, uh, what did we wind up doing? We played some Tom Waits for a sound check one day. We played Van Halen all day yesterday for sound checks. <laughs> well, it was just part of the conversation. We were talking about different, you know, Van Halen. There's that, uh, by bio- well, it's a, it's not a biography. It's sort of a, uh, a tell all that Noel Monk, their road manager during from like 78 to 85, he was under a gag order once they fired him, but, um, but now he's not. And he wrote this book called run with the devil and talks all about, you know, kind of the behind the scenes of, of Van Halen in those days. So we were talking about that book and, uh, one of the guys suggested I read it. And so then Van Halen was on the brain and Billy's, Billy's keyboard had the jump patch in it and was like, Oh yeah. And then we played, you know, hot for teacher and whatever. It was, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. So no, no, no petty though this weekend. Sorry. Did you play Petty this weekend? Come on, man. Of course. Every chance I got. <laughs> you play Petty anyway. We, yeah. we had, actually, I had one really interesting gig. So um, we, uh, we, Acoustic Madness plays at a local restaurant and um, in my town. It's just a few minutes from my home. Sure. And we, someone who came to see us there um, asked us to come play a private party at their home. Mary Ellen wasn't available. So Steve and I did it uh, as a duo. Okay. And uh, it was a really nice party. I mean, the guy was an executive at a tech company and, uh, it was beautiful home, you know, fantastic catering, really, really nice people. And it was one of those parties where, you know, they were there to talk to each other. So there was, you know, people walking by smiling, that type of thing. It wasn't like it was a captive audience for us to perform for, but, you know, throughout the evening, they would just come by and just say, this is really so nice. This had so much to the party. And at the end of the night, the host and the hostess, actually in the middle of the, of the event, the host and hostess made a request for them to dance to a song, which was really fun for us. It was a song Steve and I do all the time. Nice. And, uh, and people just got, got into it. But it was just one of those nights that was so easy. I mean, Steve and I are like butter when we do these things. I mean, the songs just kind of roll off and they're just, the tempos are nice and easy and the harmonies fall into such a nice place. He's such a great musician, you know, and and he goes, just play anything. Let me, you know, find something to it and I'll follow along with his stuff. And so we entertain ourselves when there's clearly times when not a lot of people are out and, but the evening just flowed and the people were so nice and appreciative in a way that's cool. I mean, there's, there's appreciative standing ovation, appreciative, sure. but that's not what this vibe is, right? This is a you know backyard party of which there are many conversations and people who haven't seen each other in a while hanging out to each other. So just the, the stream of gratitude and then uh, just the nice things that people said, I was just on a real high after that gig. Just, uh, it was just nice. That's the best word I can give it. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, fun. Yeah. Yeah. I love, you know, and there's something to be said about those acoustic gigs where you're playing with somebody who's comfortable, you know, you're used to each other and the sound isn't crazy loud and you're not trying to lock, you know, five, six, 10 people in together, (laughs) right? It's two or maybe three and you're all standing right next to each other. And if you need to talk and say, oh yeah, we let's go to the bridge now. Like you can do that, you, you know? Right. And, and then the harmonies are just, you're not having to sing at the top of your lungs and you can hear and blend and play with it a little. I mean, the flip side to that is every single thing you do is super exposed, but as long as you don't get petrified thinking about that, then those acoustic gigs are great. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, they, they really are the antithesis to full band gigs where, you know, you're, you know, 
finding to get your mix for yourself to hear to you know uh, the room get the room going and all those types of things there's just a lot going on to a successful yeah electric gig and this yes. was kind of the opposite of that i mean for all intents and purposes we could have had no ampl- amplification and still had a really wonderful time right <laughs> right yeah exactly have you ever played an acoustic gig without amplification um, I think I did one, oh. like someone asked me to come sing a couple Christmas songs or something like that. And I walked in and just did it. And it was fine. I mean, as a guitar player, you do it in your room all the time, right? Right. Well, I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I do. But um, we played we played a full set at someone's. It was like a Halloween party or something at this old Victorian house in Rochester. And uh, the room, it was relatively low ceilings for this room. And it just sounded good. And they had uh, an upright grand piano there that Aaron played. I think I brought congas in or whatever. And Mike mm-hmm. and it was just, I think it was just four of us. We were in between bass players. It was be- right before brought, we brought Burke into fling. So this was, you know, 10, 11 years ago or something. And, uh, you know, we, Aaron played the piano. The guys played acoustic guitars. I just played the congas and we just sang into the air. And I mean, it was, it was blissful. It was just perfect. Not every room is going to be it, like we got lucky in terms of the acoustics of the the room we were in. Right. But um, but man, I mean, we you know you can probably hear it in my voice. We all still talk about it. It's <laughs> like oh yeah, that was that was pretty magical, you know. <laughs> um, but I know some people that don't like aren't comfortable singing out loud like campfire style. They 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 feel like they need a microphone. Which is, I mean, you know, we're Weird. all, we all have our quirks, but you know, that, that one is just not, not one of mine. I'm like, no. I, well, again, I I'll like tell you the most valuable thing I ever got in a, in a voice lesson was it's all about the buzz and placing the vibration in your head is, or in your body. Yeah. In your body. Right. really the essence of singing, you know, and, and that's, I saw, there's a band in my town called Long Train Running. They're a Doobie Brothers um, uh, tribute band. Yeah. And they have some of the really best players in town. I mean, these guys have done a lot of great stuff, you know, touring musicians, very accomplished guys. And I saw them play a gig where their monitors went out and they didn't miss it. And it was a full electric gig. Yeah. They didn't miss a step with regards to their harmonies. And I think that what that's what good singers do is that they're very in tune to the vibrations that they're putting out. Yes. Yeah. You got to, you got to feel, I always say, I feel harmonies in my teeth. You, you know, but it is, it's that, right. you you feel like that, that th- those intervals and stuff locking in. I mean, it, there's a reason that we like thirds and fifths and, and, you know, and octaves, right. I mean, they, there, there is a resonance that happens and you go up the harmonic scale and you will get there. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, you definitely feel it in your body. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, and for anybody that thinks it's not possible I mean, you just told a story about a band that their monitors went out and they couldn't hear, but they still were in tune. All you need to do is go listen to, a, you know, any Beatles live recording. There were right. no monitors ever. There were barely speakers for the crowd to hear, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, yeah, it's doable. You just need practice. Like those guys trusted each other. Well, uh, think about those those people who fronted big bands, you know, in the 40s and 50s. I mean, right? they're singing over brass sections and, yeah. you know, so... Yeah. Yeah. Good luck hearing yourself when there's a trumpet behind you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did, real quick in our band where Simon sets up, the trumpets are behind him. Yeah. He always talks about being on the business end of a trumpet. And how <laughs> he went, funny. he went in ears mostly to give him a fighting chance of, of living through that. And especially when we're on small stages, totally. I mean, he literally. And one time, we we did something and um i went over to sing on simon's mic and the the trump the horns came out from their line and we we're like right behind us and it was the first time i really experienced like being head level with a trumpet and it scared the crap out of me i mean it like literally i ducked down i thought i was gonna die yeah i yeah i i, I feel you i had that at a madhouse gig we did a couple of those this year where we had you know a horn section or whatever and for one of them, they were right behind me, um, two trumpets right behind me. And man, it was like, yeah, thank goodness I have ears to put in. Cause otherwise, even with them, it was like, dude, like, that thing's just loud. <laughs> yeah. The business end of a trumpet. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> trumpets and tubas, man. That's what it's all about. I and think. squirrels. And squirrels. There you go. 
Well, that's all we got. That's all I have. Do you have anything else? I'm good, man. All right, man. Well, then it's time to uh, queue up the band and see what we got here. So, fun. Sorry we took a week off, folks. Thanks for your patience. But, Thank uh, you, Dave. We're here for you. Thank you, Paul. Hey, man, whether we're here or not, there is one thing we always want to do, and that is to always, always be performing. Always. Always. Always.